too. <laughs> um, the topic of this part of the lecture is perception. And trypophysics. And we will briefly speak about um, what receptor types of receptor cells we have, what the fundamental laws are of human perception. Those are studied and identified in the world of psychophysics, apparently. Um, of course, in 20 minutes, we can only give a very brief and shallow overview. The slides that I'm going to present in the course of the presentation all come from uh, my book, the Handbook of Multimedia Information Retrieval. And as I told you in the pre-lecture meeting, those slides and figures are all available in the Tuber Forum in the area of lecture archive. Okay, if you have problems finding them, make an entry into the social forum. Now then, so what's particular about human perception? The thing is, in the center of, of our cognition, ourselves, we have the brain, apparently. The brain, however, is kind of locked in. It is only connected to the outside world via electrical signals. And it interacts with the outside world, again, over electrical signals by moving muscles. So it is actually distant from the environment. Um, this is also called the hard problem of artificial consciousness or consciousness research in general because it means that whatever we perceive in the brain is only an electrical stimulus. And these electrical stimuli are quite similar and are the same no matter if it is actually pain that we perceive or the face of our grandmother or a lovely, a lovely piece of music. And it is unclear mostly why we are able to locate and why we are able to distinguish and perceive them differently, these stimulations of our um, environment, and of the brain by the environment. Now then, <clears throat> in order to perceive something, we need something, some device, some capture device on the boundary between the outside world and the inner self, that is the receptor cell. So here we have a layer of receptor cells. that are able to convert, for example, light energy photons into electrical signals or waves in the air into a sequence of uh, hearable frequencies, smells into electrical signals, and so for different forms of touch, vibration, pressure on the skin, plus tastes on the tongue and underneath it. Um, tongue or olfactory and, and gustatory stimuli are mostly based on very complex chemical um, receptor cells that have to be replaced very frequently, sometimes in, within a few weeks actually, whereas for example the vision system based on the cones and rods for color perception and brightness perception um, actually stay with us for a much longer time. Okay, so typical receptor cells, as we said, are the hair cells in the ears, in the cochlea organ. Um, we have rods and cones for the visual system. And we have, for example, the so-called Merkel discs and many other types for haptic recognition, for touch recognition, and so on. So, that is the perceptual side. 
the function that is performed in perception is by the receptor cell is that some physical input is transformed into an electrical output in different forms for the different senses. From nature we know of course that there are also other types of senses that can exist. For example, the possibility to hear other frequency ranges than just those that we have. So, one of the big issues of our perception is that it performs more than this transformation from the input signal to the electrical output signal. It actually already performs a first form of weighting, semantic enrichment, or at least information filtering has been calculated that the perceptual load, the amount of information that, uh, that reaches the human brain in one second equals approximately one gigabyte. A gigabyte to process per second for a structure like the brain is apparently a lot. We would probably get crazy if we would really have to do that. So about 80, 98 to 99 percent of the information are thrown away in the first stages already of the processing. We look at particular points. We convert the visual matrix into a set of on-off ganglion cells. We'll touch that briefly in a few minutes. Um, we convert the input hearing signal into uh, certain critical bands and store the amplitudes only for these critical bands and so on for the other senses. It must be said, by the way, that our auditory sense is by far the most efficient. We have 30,000 um, input cells into the brain that are able to express both language and environmental sounds, but also the most complex music that we have of Mozart and Beethoven, for example. And Chopin, whatsoever. Okay. Now, these early stages of, of processing are investigated and described in the science of psychophysics. The fundamental idea was, it started out in the, in the, in the 19th century with two German physicists, Fechner and Weber. As far as I remember, both of them involved in the emerging optical industry, like so many other scientists before who had worked in optics, including Newton and Spinoza, for example, um, started to wonder why what we perceive as human beings is apparently not what is happening in our physical environment. So one example is in hearing that the loudness increases exponentially by magnitudes of tens in comparison to what we perceive. So if you crank up your radio at home, it means that you're actually multiplying the sound pressure level that the signal is given and is um, enhanced. Okay, so what Weber and Fechner defined was the first law of psychophysics and it was that essentially the change the, the change in perception is logarithmic to the physical change for a number of stimuli. Apparently not all of them, but for some of them in particular in the audiovisual subsystem of the brain. So they defined <clears throat> that what we have physically is called phi. Taking the logarithm of them is what we perceive is Psi. So Psi stands for the inner perception and Phi stands for the outward stimulus, the physical part. That is the first law, I think that was called the Fechner law, I'm not sure anymore. Um, of course, at times a constant was added um, and more was said about the actual change and the, and, and the detail change. But these changes are not so important because anyway the Weber Fechner law is outdated today and we, it was replaced by Stevens law, um, which we are going to investigate in a few minutes. But the fundamental system stayed the same. So we still deal with 
the perception of the outside world, psi versus phi, and we are wondering for different types of stimuli what the function between the two might be. Often, as we said, it's logarithmic, sometimes it's not. Okay, before we come to the Stevens law, let's have a look at a few aspects of perception. One of them is particularly important, in my opinion, for the course. It is um, the flow of information in the human brain, which is, I think, to a degree, enlightening for what is actually happening. As I said, this figure, like the others, are just from the book. They are very elementary, so that we can actually enhance them and paint on them. Okay, so what do we have? We have, of course, the cortex. As part of the cortex, we have the motor cortex. Underneath the cortex, or part of it, we also have the thalamus and the hypothalamus and we have very important here also the cerebellum and going out into the brain stem back down here. Okay, very important part of the cortex are the so-called subcortical regions if I remember correctly, apparent about here. So this is a term that you should remember. Okay, one area that is very interesting for us is certainly the Broca area. This is for speech production. Right here, somewhere, we have the so-called Wernicke area, which is for speech perception, but it has been clarified that other centers are also very important for the understanding of language and for the so-called semantics, of course. Semantics is mostly transported in our symbol-based uh, world today over language, and therefore these two concepts are closely related. There is a whole description of what is important, which, by the way, includes the visual cortex, um, in the so-called Schwind model. Norman Schwind was an American um, psychologist who defined details of this model of semantic information processing in the human brain. Okay, so, and this thing here was the cerebellum. Okay, so the general line of operations in the brain is that we have input from receptor cells coming along here, for example, coming along from the eyes, coming from the ears, uh, and these things, these stimuli, are processed and are layered, are processed in a layered fashion, thus building, as we would call them in IT, pipelines, processing chains, so-called pathways. Most important or most well investigated is the visual cortex, the visual pathway, there is an area V1, an area V4, one of them is color detection, another one is object detection, there is movement detection, and so on. Pathways have sub-pathways, and so on. But what is interesting and intriguing for us is that the processing goes tend with the tendency from older areas towards evolutionary scene, newer areas of the brain that were later um, added by our evolution. That means that, to a certain degree, we share our capacity for processing perceptual stimuli with other animals. Beyond that degree, we have our own systems. What is also very interesting, and what I would like to point out, is in the cerebellum down here, we have a very high concentration of neural cells, and these neural cells store 
mostly so-called complex pattern generators. CPGs. CPGs are stored procedures, as we IT people would call them, for um, complex movement, speech movement, for example, and, 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 and other, other muscle systems. Okay, so these can be triggered by relatively few um, inputs and cause a complex behavior of the human body. So this is a middleware between the high-level semantic processing, which happens around here, and the interaction with the physical world, which happens here. So it comes in from the different forms of perception, with early processing, heavy information filtering, goes through the processing pipelines of the pathways. Pathways have essentially two dimensions. It is the same operation, so a sequence of operations, happening one after the other for certain spatial auditory or whatsoever location. A spatial location of course is an area on the on the retina on the fovea. Huh? An auditory area is a certain critical band, so a frequency area going from uh, 220 to 440 Hertz or whatsoever. So these are different locations and for these different locations one after the other we have a fully wired processing chain which is the pathway as we said the further up we go here in this in this development the more complex the operations become if you watch the video on the neuron, then you have seen that each individual neuron is actually a convolution operation for the inputs to the outputs. Uh, that means that the input is to a small degree semantically enriched. So, for example, if your input is a sequence of frequencies, 220 Hz, 290, 330, and so on, one neuron might aggregate these inputs for a moment in time and might be able to conclude from that that what we have as input is, due to the lack of an overtone structure, for example, an environmental sound and not a piece of music. Um, you might think of uh, <laughs> an application scenario as you're sitting in a concert hall, you are um, uh, observing and, and listening to an, an, uh, a sonata of, 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 of Beethoven and suddenly you hear a crack. The crack comes uh, from the wall or from, from the ceiling uh, coming down um, on the guests. And this neuron would then be able to distinguish from the music, recognizing overtone structures, that this is actually an environmental sound and thus trigger longer on, in, uh, further, further down, a reaction of the brain, which would be one of the uh, fight or flight mechanisms in the in the parasympathetic in the sympathetic uh, area of the brain but that is of course out of our focus okay so every individual neuron in the pathways adds a little bit of semantics by aggregating as we said weighting down and propagating to the next level okay that is one aspect the cerebellum stored procedures, semantic enrichment. The other one is that it doesn't end in the cortex. The processing doesn't end. There is a lot of evidence that in the subcortical regions, somewhere here, further similarity measurement and semantic enrichment happens. And there is a lot of cross sending of the signal in these areas, as far as I have read in, in, in the books. That means that semantically enriched information in one respect is sent 
to neurons that investigate other, um, other aspects and the other way around. So you can imagine the subcortical region as an area or as a room full of experts and these experts are continuously exchanging information among each other. And at some point in time, very, very quickly, of course, in the human brain, sometimes only a question of milliseconds, um, an order is issued and that order goes to an area which is conveniently located nearby and that is the motor cortex. Motor cortex up here. And from the motor cortex, it goes down the cerebellum again. So, if we pick the green color, because everything else has already been used, let's sum it up. Um, information comes in, is heavily filtered first, is then processed and prepared for the semantic areas of the brain, is then even more investigated in, by exchange in the subcortical regions, and causes reactions. Our reactions as human beings are always muscle-based. Speech is something muscle-based, of course, and that triggers the motor cortex. Going to the cerebellum, there are the stored procedures for the actual uh, pronunciation of words, for example, movement of the hands in order to do gestures, and from there it goes out into the entire body. So this is in short, the processing chain that we have in the brain. Okay, we are still in the area of perception and psychophysics. That was the general view of um, of the flow of information. Now, a very quick example of what the receptor cell can look like. Um, yeah, if we take the if we take the ear as an example and stay with the green color. Then, of course, what we have here is a wave, a pressure wave that goes through the air, uh, that hits the outer ear, is then for individual frequency bands um, enhanced and improved, in particular, three to four thousand hertz are amplified in the in the ear, then hits the eardrum, goes over the ossicles and eventually arrives in the cochlea organ. And that is where the actual processing happens. The cochlea organ looks like a spiral. In it contains the hair cells of different length. The longest one in the center, that's by the way why we need for the base frequencies, the higher, the highest amplitude, the highest energy, in order to be able to hear them. Unfortunately, those with the highest energy are the ones most easily able to penetrate walls, and that is what causes problems with your neighbors when you turn up the volume of your stereo. So, as we said, this air wave, by the way, converted into a fluid wave, inside the cochlea, so this is filled with a fluid that contains a lot of potassium ions, hits the actual receptor cells, which are the hair cells, and there is a gating mechanism, but we won't go through that. The point is, the gating mechanism allows certain ions to enter, a chemical reaction triggers a free electron, and that free electron is then propagated to the brain over the auditory nerve. So it is actually a mechanical, chemical, electrical process that allows us to hear. The mechanical part, by the way, is the, huge, is the big problem because what is mechanical can actually break by exposing your ear to too high sound pressure levels. Um, you can actually break the so-called tip links between the hair cells, thus causing certain gates never to open again and other gates never to close again. And that is what you can call a tinnitus.
or a certain form of tinnitus. So don't do that. Okay, so that was very briefly on, on how the perceptual side actually works. In this process, as we said, a lot of information is lost and thrown away. That is because of the different length of the hair cell and the grouping of the hair cell, thus creating the so-called, maybe we put that here, critical bands. Um, if you would like to hear more about that, have a look at the Barkhausen scale on Wikipedia, for example, or in the book on psychophysics of, of Schmeidler, for example, or come to my lectures in the winter term. There we go through that in detail because it's important for the lab course. So this was an example of a perception algorithm in the brain. Now let's have a look at the filtering algorithm, still in the context of perception and psychophysics. And that is here an so-called on ganglion cell or an off ganglion cell actually what depends on how we interpret the image so in the eye as we said we have the fovea in the back we have the we have the visual the visual nerve and we have our receptor cells. Let's focus on the cones. We have to, cones are um, sensitive to incoming light photons, and they are sensitive on different wavelengths, thus approximately creating three different types of, of cones for red, green, and blue. As you might know, red and green are very closely together, where the peak is in the sensitivity, and therefore, since they were only developed only late in evolution, and therefore they might easily be mixed up. And if you have a certain uh, certain genetic defect, then you cannot distinguish red from green. So we stay with the red, with the green color here, and don't use much red in the rest of this diagram. Now, what's a ganglion cell? It comes very early after there's a receptor cell. The, the cone provides us with the transformation of a photon into an electron. The electron is propagated over the visual nerve. And in the very first stage of processing, close to the eye still, we have a distinct uh, a kind of edge detection algorithm, as we would call it, through the ganglion cells. And that works as follows. Incoming signals are compared to the environment. In this case, we have an off bipolar, an on bipolar cell, and here an off bipolar cell. Off, mean, off means that this cell fires if there is no input light, no input signal. And on means that this one fires if there is a signal. Well, that is easy with given a neuron. If you have inputs, and they are beyond the threshold, the cell fires. That's the normal thing. But how does the off bipolar cell work? It works as follows. It is um, a so-called tonic cell. A tonic cell with an inhibition mechanism. And that means that once you have an input, that input actually inhibits the cell from firing. So we have a type of um, of connection between, between two cells that is actually not excitatory but inhibitory. Such synapses are very common in the brain. They are not so common in artificial neural networks. However, they are important for the implementation of certain behaviors, as we will see when we speak about the details of the brain, of the brain tears. So, tonic means that the cell itself is able to generate firing patterns and provides them as kind of background light, if you like, for the visual system, but also for other subsystems and only stops firing once it is inhibited. Okay, now what's the on-off ganglion cell? That is a combination of these bipolar cells. In the example, we have the measurement of a short edge with a certain direction and with a certain length. The fundamental length in the fovea are 
ends within the fovea or goes beyond the fovea. Fovea is the area where you have a high concentration of cones. That means that you have a high resolution of the visual system. So lengths are limited to these two types, but the orientations actually in the brain are very fine grained for different angles of the detected edge. So what does this ganglion cell pattern do? In the concrete example, if we have light on the outside and no light on the inside, means a dark edge, um, light to dark edge, then this pattern fires. Now we have similar groups of scanning devices um, for all sorts of orientations and, as I said, for these two types of length. And therefore, one early stage of processing is, as we said, a mechanism of edge detection already, a very efficient one. This has been investigated in particular in the 1960s and has, as uh, early as in the 1990s, already been implemented in... Um, visual information retrieval applications, most notably in the MPEG-7 standard, there is uh, one extraction mechanism, feature engineering mechanism called the MPEG-7. Um, no, it's not the edge histogram. It's, the, uh, it's a texture feature, a homogeneous texture feature, exactly. And yeah, that made use of this pattern. Okay, so this is an example for the next stage after the receptor cell, when such an on-off ganglion cell already does information filtering, thus reducing the huge grid of information that comes from the receptor cells to a set of semantically already enriched information that is processed by the brain. Now, what's the semantic enrichment here? We take input light and give output edge. An edge is something that has a meaning our visual system. It is very, very important. Okay, so let's carry on. In the very beginning of this part of the lecture, we said that physics investigates the relationship of what we perceive, see, with what is actually the case. Weber and Fechner observed that sometimes or often this relationship is logarithmic. But this is not always the case. Um, and in the course of investigation of psychophysical behavior, um, as late as the 1950s, a more general notion was developed. And this is called Stevens' Power Law, stating that what we perceive is essentially, um, of course, weighted what is happening um, by the power of A. And A is called Stevens' exponent. Okay. With that form of law, it was possible to define many, many different forms of behavior. In this chart, which is again from, from my book, I have laid down Stevens' power law is the name. For obvious reasons. Um, in this chart, I have collected a few extreme examples, the most extreme being electroshock. And what we have here is the stimulation. So that's the, uh, the phi side. And reception, that's the C side. So if I stimulate a human being with an amount of electroshock that goes beyond a certain limit, the perception is very soon very, very strong. So this is not logarithmic, but the other way around. It's exponential to a very high degree. In practice, that mean, means electroshock are either not perceived in a very small area perceived as pleasant or at least, at least bearable, and beyond that perceived as completely unbearable. Okay. Different, uh, completely different example would be loudness. Here the second line, the dotted line, um, which is indeed logarithmic. That means that 
if we turn up the sound pressure level, the, we perceive an increase in loudness, but that increase is not as big as the physical energy that was invested into um, increasing the sound pressure. Okay, between the two lies such things as muscle force. If I increase the muscle force, the perception is always also exponential. Um, warmth is perceived stronger than coldness, for example. That has been has turned out to be a problem, in particular if you live in colder regions, where hospitals report way more uh, frozen limbs due to coldness than actual burns. Why? Because if, if you have a burn on your skin, you perceive it more strongly, so will, you will react sooner. If we think of the processing chain in the brain, the path from perception of a burn to motor to maybe cerebellum to a reaction is much shorter and more efficient than for coldness. Coldness is perceived less than warmth and therefore it might more easily happen to you that you actually have, have a freeze of one of the limbs. Okay, a, uh, an extreme example for something that is not even logarithmic is viscosity. Uh, perceived, I believe, on, on the palm might be increased to a very strong degree and you will still not perceive it. So it's either here or there. Either you perceive it or not, but you cannot really distinguish different forms. That is Stephen's power law. That is what is today uh, state of the art in psychophysics, I believe. Um, it is very convenient because in the event you only have to investigate for a certain type of stimulation the exponent and of course um, the weight of the function, everything else is set. There is still a lot of uh, psychophysical research going on and uh, yeah, new relationships of perception and physical reality are identified. So to sum up this part of the lecture and maybe also conclude on what could be useful for your seminar tasks. We have receptor cells at the entrance of our brain. These receptor cells do the transformation from the world to the outer world to the inner world of the brain. On the other hand, we have the motors, which are, in the context of our lab, um, not so interesting, but of course would also be intriguing to investigate. Um, this transformation is based on the laws of psychophysics. It is based also on information filtering, so only a small fraction of what is in happening in the outside world really enters the brain and is processed there, in particular in the cortex and in the subcortical regions. How do we informate how do we filter information? That is already a first step of semantic enrichment, meaning that we identify critical bands in the auditory nerve, we identify edges in the visual nerve, furthermore color blobs, um, different types of movement, and so on. Doing the semantic enrichment allows us to omit the basic signal which happens sometimes but not always. There is, for example, a kind of mirroring of the input visual system in the visual cortex, which is also important. If you worked with uh, deep networks before, in particular recurrent networks, then you know that in order to, to prevent the signal from degenerating, one method is to reload the processing result of earlier stages into later layers of the, of the system. So, the most important conclusion you should take for the lab course is that the brain is locked in. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. We are only com com communicating with the outside world over electrical signals, which is intriguing because we appear to be in the middle of the, of the world. As a matter of fact, we are not. And a second thing that you should take is that the way we stimulate the brain has an influence on how 
we are actually perceiving the outer world. So we are to a degree mirroring what happens outside on our inner screen. But that's a topic of a different video on the introduction of artificial consciousness.